Randy Garn. Are you kidding me? This guy's actually my cousin. <laughs> he sold one of his first companies for a whole lot of money. He has won Entrepreneur of the Year by Ernst & Young. That's one of the most prestigious awards you can get in the world. He is a New York Times best-selling author. He has an MBA from Harvard. And now he works with a multi, multi, multi-billionaire, and together they consult the leading CEOs in the world on strategy. A couple of his kids are here. He has six kids. He's an okay golfer, not like David Bradford. But you guys, Randy Garn is a ball of energy, a spiritual walking faith bomb. And I, you guys have to cheer for Randy Garn right now. Get on stage. Oh, I love this guy. What's up? I love you. Spence. <laughs> First off, can we give Spence a huge round of applause? He is the man. We got, Char, bring his gift up. We got a gift for you. Get up. Man, I get a gift. This Sweet. is it. Oh, are those my clothes? Bring it up. Bring it up. So <laughs> this is my amazing wife, Charlotte. The best decision I ever made was marrying this young lady right here. Oh. The most decision I'll ever made. Thank you, Charlotte. Do you want to come up here and say a few things? <laughs> <laughs> so Spence, these have been at my house for how long? Several months. Oh, you, dear. I, I don't mean, know if we should show them. Look at this. This is what he was wearing golfing with me. Right there. So, I love then, those shorts, though. Now, these shorts are nice. Though. They are epic. You. So, they're back. I actually brought you something back from Hawaii, and it's back there. But okay, your clothes are my back. Clothes. Merry I appreciate Christmas. it. <laughs> I love this guy. You guys, Randy Garn. Oh, I love it. <clears throat> wow. Um, you know, it, it's, been, it's been such an amazing night. I'm, just, I'm so thankful that Spence asked me to, to be here tonight, listening to Amy and Jeff. And all David Bradford, uh, Paul, like everybody. Can we give them another round of applause? I mean, that was amazing, Jeff. (laughs) One of the things I just wanted to share with you quickly is kind of a really good um, check. We, it's nine o'clock right now. And when we have really, really long meetings at our work, our CEO, he always, he always says, okay, guys, it's time to get frothy. Who knows what frothy means? (laughs) Does anybody know what frothy means? (laughs) Okay, so in the mornings, when I, I, I take a big glass of orange juice every morning, and what happens, right? It settles. And all of that, the good stuff, all the pulp either comes to the top or the bottom, depending on if you get it from winter or somewhere else, you know? So it is time to get frothy. Are you guys ready? I want everybody to stand up, take a shake, get, get, it, get, it, get going. Let's get some blood going here. Let's get some music going. Sing to your neighbor. Shake it up a little bit, because it's about to get crazy. Let's do this. All right, you guys good? You got it all working out. Hallie, I want you shaking it up there. Okay, this is it. Up next, we got the guy. Double time it. Got to double time it. All right, we are, are we frothy enough? Let's do it. We got dancing right after this. Okay, so I'm going to do a little check with you guys, if we could. Who ever gets lost in the mall or someplace and is always so thankful when you find that, like that you are here map? Does anybody, I mean, aren't those the best? You're just like, my gosh, I'm on the third floor. I should be down to Macy's on the second floor. I'm totally trying. I'm at the gap here. But I wanted to show you guys kind of just a little bit of a you are here map, um, if I could. Where's my, uh, where's my rope guys at? Bring it on up here. We've got... You know, I thought a lot about this um, presentation. I want to kind of put myself in when I was going to college or, you know, younger, what would I have wished that somebody would have told me to help me really maximize my learning and my earning potential? What is your return on education? And as you look at this right here, I want to just show you this. So if you look at this, can everybody see that little red thing right here? You got a white rope and I've got about eight or nine inches of red. And on here is your life. And if you're like 20 years old, you're like maybe a 20th percent in. Because we're all going to live to be over 100, right? Let's do this. Let's live good long lives. So on here, this is our life. This was before we came to this earth. Okay? 
and you've got a lot more to go. I'm all, I'm all, I'm all, I got one foot in the grave, so I'm about halfway there. But we've had some fun. And if you look at this, and you connect this other side of this rope, this is eternity. And just like Amy with the lives that she touched in India, or Jeff with all the lives that he's touching on media, you connect this rope, and if you went around this whole building, that doesn't even come close to eternity. You wrap this thing around all of Salt Lake City, that doesn't even come close to it. You wrap this thing around the whole world, we're talking about forever and ever and ever. So I want to talk about decisions you make today and what it can do for you for the rest of your life, your careers, your education, the amazing person that you are going to marry, or the kids' lives that you're going to change. And so I want you guys, as you think about this today, I want to kind of do a, you are here check. Does that make sense? Like we are in a very, very finite time, and I'm privileged to share, you know, about 20 minutes with you. All right. So when I first was growing up, um, my dad was a high school football coach, and I grew up in Sugar City, Idaho, a really, really cold place. We got any uh, diggers out there? We got any Sugar City people? All right. How about anybody from uh, Brazil here? Brasilia. Anybody from Africa? Anybody from the UK? Anybody from Utah here? Anybody from Wyoming? Anybody from Jersey? Okay, so we got a good demographic of people. So if I kick into a little New York accent, hey, forget about it. Then you guys will know what I'm doing. All right, so I grew up in Sugar City, Idaho. My father was a high school football coach. We literally had... 300 cows, 50 horses. We lived on a ranch too. So we'd get up really early. We'd go out and milk the cows. We'd say prayers and then we'd all put it in. Go Garns! And we did that almost every morning. That's just how we ran it. And so I grew up in a very, very, very positive atmosphere. Um, my dad was a very God-fearing man. Um, and I'm so thankful for that, that both my mom and dad loved their Savior, Jesus Christ, and taught us amazing principles. Um, and I really do think that that's what's helped me be successful in everything that I do. And so I want to talk about three things today. What it means to believe, what it means to belong, and what it means to become. Those are the three main things I want to hit on today. Um, I want you guys to first focus on the one that's believe, okay? What do you believe? What do you believe in yourself? What do you believe you can accomplish? I want you to think about a lot of things were shared today as like, what is your uniqueness? We teach in business leaders, we teach the principle of core competencies. Our chairman is, he has a business model called the Sunflower Model. He's had tons of exits, um, four of them north of a billion dollars, and he focuses on what is the company's core competency for growth. And so I want you to think about what is your core competency, what is your irreducible zero? What is it that God made you and put you on this earth to accomplish? I want you to think about that while you watch this video. Here's to the crazy ones, the rebels, the troublemakers, the ones who see things differently. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. All right, so isn't that an amazing video? Every time I watch that, and I watched it again this morning in preparation, you think about all those people that didn't let people tell them that they couldn't do something. They believed in themselves. And there's a saying in India, I went, actually went to India too, and one of their sayings is called Genshai, and it means never treat another person small, including yourself. And so not only do you have to believe in others, you really, really, it's so important to believe in yourself. And especially as you're doing your business, your work, everything, you have to have confidence in yourself. And especially when nobody else does. It's so important. So as we think about that, who are some of the people that were in there? Who can name some of them? Do you remember? Who? Okay. Albert Einstein, I heard. Bob Dylan. We had Bob Dylan, Martin Luther. Who else? John Lennon. John Lennon. Who else? Martha Graham. Did you get that one? Muhammad Ali, one of my favorites of all time. Come on, baby. Who else? Alfred Hitchcock. Mahatma Gandhi. Jim Henson. Marie Callas. Pablo Picasso. And 
Jerry. We had Jerry in there too. So when you think about the word belief, um, what do you think about? What does that word mean to you? Somebody tell me. What does it mean? Okay. What do you, what do you think is possible? What do you believe? What is something that you know or you hope that exists and something that you are wanting to push towards? Something that you have an assurance in, right? Yes. Okay. So evidence you have an assurance in that you take action on and then the evidence will come, right? Okay. All right. Okay. So let's talk about this. There are, there's a lot of studies in, of the brain and God made us and he made our brains. And so to study science is really important to think about how does our brain really work? There's two things in our brain called possibility and probability thinking. What do you think these two are? What does possibility thinking mean? Who can tell me? Huh? What can be? It's like somebody said that it couldn't be done, right? But I'm going to do it anyways. It's like that unbreakable thing, like the people that we watched have a possibility mindset. How about a probability mindset? How many of you in there, how many out there know somebody that's a complainer? You know, does anybody have those in their family? Hey, you know, the shower's too hot. I got soap. I, I got to sleep in. I can't do this. I mean, there's, that's the probability mindset. There's no way I'm going to make it there in time. Forget about it. It ain't happening. You know, how many of you guys got roommates like that? Don't raise your hands, but just be thinking about it. But I want to think in, inside yourself, which brain are you using most of the time? And which side of it? They're both important. It's not one is more important than the other one, but probability thinkers um, make a lot less money than possibility thinkers. There's a, there's a huge study from the London School of Economics on it about those people that, are, that think about the possibilities and that say, you know what? If somebody tells me I can't do that, I'm going to go do it. I'm just going to find a way. I'm going to be innovative and ideate. I'm going to ideate how to do this and figure this out. And so as you think about that, I want to challenge you guys to think about the possibility um, mindset and the probability mindset. I want to challenge you to c catch yourself whenever you're complaining or being doubtful or thinking doubtful things. It's important when you do this. So we have a rule. Um, we, we call it the garn grumpies. If anybody gets grumpy... It's always like it's the garn grumpies. Oh, he's grumpy again. So you have to think about that. I want to challenge you guys to try to stay in the possibility mindset for 10 days. Can you guys do that? Will you do that with me? All right. I want it seriously. 10 days of being in the possibility mindset and zero complaining for 10 days. If you complain one time, you don't get Cheerios for the morning. All right. But I want you guys to think about this. Say, I'm not going to complain for 10 days. Watch what it does to your mind. Watch what it does to your health. Watch what it will do to your wealth. Watch what it will do for your opportunities. Think about those things. Because one of the things that's, that's important when you complain, it actually puts a doubt in your mind. It puts fear in your mind. And you can't accomplish the things that you're supposed to accomplish here on earth. Now, one of the things that is important, it's okay to have issues, but one of the things that when you're, as you're doing this, if somebody comes to you with a complaint, start telling them this, what's the solution? All right? You can do this in your, with your business models, with your families or whatever. One way you can help them to be able to break that habit is just say, what's the solution? Everybody say that with me. What's the solution? Okay? That, it works so magically. My wife is so awesome at it. I'll come to her and I'll be like, honey, we need to do this. And she'll, well, what's the solution? Like some of our kids will be like, I can't find my dance shoes. I can't fit into my leotards. I can't do this. It's like, okay, what's the solution? You know, think about that. When anytime anybody comes to you, you can actually teach people how they treat you. Um, I always, I've thought about this a lot too. And this is an interesting principle is that as you think about faith, as you're in the possibility mindset or the probability mindset, is that faith and fear both demand that we believe in something that we cannot see. Which one will you choose? Which one will you choose? They're both, 90% of the things we worry about never happen. So think about who you are, what you want to do, and be very, very positive and proactive about it, okay? 
Um, the first, that's the first principle is to believe. I want you guys to believe in yourselves and really just figure out exactly what it is that you want to accomplish and do in your lives and go do that. Go figure that out. The next part is to belong. I love this principle of belonging. Every one of us have a tremendous sense of belonging. And this is such a great principle. I had the opportunity to go in November over to Africa, to Johannesburg, and then out to an, an Ireland. I love it. It's a beautiful place. And then we flew three and a half miles to a little island in Mauritius and got to be able to experience a lot of amazing things there and see everything from wealth to very impoverished situations. And one of, the th- one of the things in Africa that they teach is called Ubuntu. Do you know what that stands? What does that mean? Tell me. Is it? <laughs> Spell it. Ubuntu. Yeah, okay, ends with a U. Okay. They must have spelled it wrong in Mauritius, but anyways, it's French. Uh, Tell me what it means. I am because we are. I am because we are. Dude, this is a good young man right here. Can we give him a good round of applause? <clears throat> I, I am because we are. And you think about that. I am because we are. Um, the first time I heard this story, there was, a, there was a philanthropist and an anthropologist that was in Africa studying, you know, the African culture. And even though he was looking, why are these children so amazingly happy? Why are they so happy? And why do they, you know, just love each other and support each other? So one day he went to the store and he got a big box of, of candy and he said, I'm going to do a little test and I'm going to see what happens. He got this box of candy and he went and put it by this tree. And he went and then he gathered all the kids and he said, kids, come with me. Everybody come over here. I've got a humongous box of candy, a huge sack of candy over here under this tree. I want you all to run and get it. Whoever gets their first wins. All right, let's line up. They all lined up. And he said, all right, ready? Now go. And guess what happened? They all walked. They all walked and he was marveled by that, that they all walked, they got the candy together, and they passed it out and shared it with one another. Now, I know that I have twin boys that are two years old. I've got twin girls that are seven. And I know that those two sets of twins, if I lined them up, and I told them there was a stack of candy in the tree, I know that Max and Jack would be fighting like two cougars in a gunny sack over that candy. (laughs) But I mean, this is an amazing principle. As you think about this principle in the gospel of Jesus Christ, I am because we are, right? The, the young, the little kid, he asked one of the kids and he said, how can I be happy when everyone else is sad? How can I be happy when everyone else around me is sad? And so as you think about ways, um, as you think about ways that you're going to earn an income, as you think about what line of work you're going to accomplish and what you're going to do, I went to pre-med almost, I mean, my whole time going to, to Rick's college. And I loved it. I said, I know I'm going to go into medicine. I want to be a doctor. I wanted to be a doctor for the money. I really did. I was like, you know what? I'll be able to support my family. I'll be able to do this. But guess what stopped me? It was chemistry. As soon as I got to chemistry, it was like, it was like a cheese grater on my brain. I could not even think chemistry. I don't know why, but I took it two times and I was like, I can't do this. And I was back from my mission. I served a mission in the Philippines. And I came back from my mission. And my dad was a, a football coach. So we didn't have a lot of funds. And he's like, you guys got to pay for your own. You got to pay for your own schooling. And so I thought to myself, how can I do this? What can I do to earn an income to pay for my college? Do I have to work part time? What am I going to need to do? So me and my friends in, in Sugar City in Rexburg, it's really, really cold in the winters. And so we were in, sitting in FHE one day with all of our, uh, with our, the young women in our FHE. And they said, hey, would you guys take our garbage out for us? And one of my friends said, yeah, we'll do it for a dollar. And all four of the girls said, well, I'll give you a dollar. I'll give you a dollar. Will you guys come every week to do this for us? I was like, you know what? All of a sudden, something just clicked. And I said, if these four girls would do it, what about the next dorm and the next dorm and the next dorm? So within two weeks, we had 300 young women paying us $4 a dorm room. I want, who can do math for me? Okay, we had 300 young, young women. It was $4 per apartment, okay? 300 times four. We were doing it two times a week, every Thursday and Saturday morning. Okay, how much is that? How much? 
2,400. That was every week. And then we did it four times a week. What's the total? How much? $9,600 for taking the trash out for young women at Ricks College, Idaho. And then we did it all summer long. We were making, and we split that between three of us. So how much was I making a month? $3,200 a month. And so were the two other guys with me. We covered our cash. And you know what else happened? Did we get to know a lot of girls? Yes. We were the buck buck boys. We were the trash. We were turning trash to cash. It was awesome. It was amazing. And I, all of a sudden, like, I said, you know what? I'm not going to be a doctor. I'm going to be an entrepreneur. And from then, my whole life changed. Like, I literally get goosebumps right now thinking about that day when I was like, you know what? I know what I want to do. I know how to create. I know how to be able to turn something, a need, into revenue. And from then on, it was just, it was an, it's an amazing journey from there. And then we started our company when I was a sophomore at BYU. And then we ended up selling the, and we ended up uh, um, uh, growing that company. I ran for student body president that next year at Ricks College. One student body president, I think because all the girls knew who I was. I had an upper hand. I had an upper trash cash hand. And uh, I mean, it was amazing. And the eight guys that I ran against, I ended up starting having all eight of them be on my my advisory board or my vice presidents at Rick's. And then four of us started a business together. And then we won Entrepreneur of the Year together. We, I mean, it was just an amazing time. From that time, um, I've just never looked back. And I said, you know what? I love being an entrepreneur. I love creating. I love creating jobs and I love doing these things. From that, I've been able to really understand um, the power of being able to have a business and to share the gospel. And we were, I get to speak to CEOs all over the place on strategy and innovation and execution. We have some business models. And one time I was speaking to a group of CEOs and I just happened to say, um, you know, no amount, I can't even remember what Apostle said it, but I just thought of it tonight when I was sitting there, um, when Jeff was talking, that no amount, no amount of, uh, no amount of um, success in business can compensate for failure in the home. Think about that, that. No amount of success in business can compensate for failure at the home. We went out after that, and we were riding on a, a golf cart, and the guy that was with me, a very, very successful man, was just in tears. And he's like, Randy, I need to know how to repent. How do I repent? He's like, I've done some things that I feel so bad about. I don't know what to do. I don't want to lose my family. And here I am on a golf course with this guy that's hugely successful. And the only thing that he can think about is his kids. And I have an opportunity and a platform to share the gospel. And I share it unapologetically to everybody that we come in contact with. And it's so fun to be able to do that. And I basically sat there on the golf course and said, let me tell you what happened in the early 1800s. Jesus Christ, our heavenly father, appeared to a prophet, restored the priesthood. He's like, how do, I mean, tell me about baptism. So, I mean, it's just amazing of the things that you're able to do. And he's taking the missionary discussions right now. But that doesn't just happen every once in a while. That happens all of the time. If you live right, and if you pick a career that you're able to touch people's lives and whether you're a doctor, an attorney, or whatever that is, and you live that gospel, you'll be able to really, really be successful. Um, the other thing that I think that's really important is to understand when you're getting ready to get married. Do we have any people getting ready to get married out here? I was getting ready to get married. Do we have any single people out there? I guess I should say it in a different way. All right. Okay. All right. So we do have some single. Do we really have any single people out there? All right. Okay. I will tell you that the single best thing that you will ever do is to find the right companion that loves their Savior, Jesus Christ, and understands who God is. Because they will help you so much. When you're in business, you really cannot, there is no definition, there's no line between, I'm going to be one person at work, and then I'm going to be one person at home. I used to always think that. I used to always think that, hey, I'm going to do everything I can here and this. But like nowadays, like you work 24-7. You're always doing things. Your emails never shut off. Um, I think it, it was who Amy was talking about how many messages you get a day and what happens. Does it ever stop? So you have to figure out how to control it and make time and make sure that you find an awesome, awesome wife. I want to show you, this is my beautiful family right here. 
I've got, uh, I've got four ballerinas. If I get Hallie and Grace stand up, here's my two of my daughters right here. They just won a dance competition. They're going to New York in April. <laughs> and, you know, I go to work every day and I go to business every day for them and try to do everything that you can. And so the best thing that you can do is find an amazing, amazing spouse to share the rest of your life with. And if you go back to that rope, you know, it's a short time, but you get to spend all eternity with this group of people. This is who you belong to. And this is what that core is, um, when you understand and do that. The last principle that I wanna talk about is what it means to become. And if you think about this as you, as you become, um, I really love this talk, this quote from uh, Elder Uchtdorf. He says, the institutions of the world teach us to know something. The gospel of Jesus Christ challenges us to become something. And so as you look, about, as you look at this, um, we have amazing faculty here at the LDS Business College. I was able to go teach at a class and saw how much your faculty love you. Do we have any faculty that's here tonight? If we could, could we have them stand up? Stand up if we have faculty here. Can we give, can we give them, a, can we give this, our faculty a huge round of applause? They are amazing. And they, they understand this and they are teaching you this in, in your classes. You know, as, as far as that goes on this same, same vein, it says good intentions are not enough. We must do. Um, more importantly, we must become what Heavenly Father wants us to be. And that's the thing that's so important as part of becoming and part of belonging is you have to take action. I sit on an advisory board with uh, Brandon Steiner. He bought the old New York Yankees stadium and we get to do a ton of things with amazing athletes all the time. But his favorite saying is, uh, you do what you did. Hey, Randy, you do what you did. You know, you don't do what you should have or could have or would have. You do what you actually did. So he'll have people come up in his office and he'll be like, hey, Jimmy, I told you to get that report for me. Well, you know, you do what you did. Go get it done and then come back and talk to me. I mean, it's, it's hilarious, but it's so true. Think about how much you can accomplish if you really put a hard action together. That's how we become. You get really aggressive. You get active in every single second of your life and live it to the complete fullest. All right, so I'm gonna share with you this principle from, uh, from Maheli Machitsman Heli. He's Hungarian and, he's, and his whole life has been on the study of what it means to become. And really what he says is what it becomes is the flow of, of happiness. When you're in that zone, when you know that you're doing exactly what God wants you to do and you're stretching yourself. He studied this, this he's made it a, a thing of his whole life. And so I want you to look at this slide. And so one of the things that we talk about is that if you look on the up, upward one, the vertical one, challenge is when you're challenged, and when your challenge is low, and your skills are low, you're in apathy. Do you see where that is? See where that green one is, is boredom. So you have low challenges, and your skills aren't really being stretched, okay? I wanna share with you guys a model. This is a business model, this is a personal model to know when you're actually in the, in the flow, okay? If your challenges are high, and your skill set's low, that means you're, you start getting really ang anxious and you start having anxiety. And so if there's any of you that are out there, you'd need to then say, you know what? If I have anxiety about this, I need to start increasing my skill power along with my willpower, okay? Along with what I could actually do, I have to start increasing my skills, okay? When the challenges get high and your skills are there, this is like me skiing um, the other day with somebody that was really, really, really good and, and I'm, I'm okay, I'm like the little ball of hate on skis, but this guy, he was a maniac. Black diamonds, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm really going down there. <laughs> and so I just hit it like a madman. And I was really excited, but I did, I was like between anxiety and excitement. And I mean, it was a garage sale. I went down hard. <clears throat> <laughs> and he's just laughing the whole way because he was in the flow. But I was seriously, and you think about that. In your life, where are you at right now? I want you just to think, where am I at on this chart right now? Do I have anxiety? Do I have worries? Am I in control? You know, later on we went on some, I got a little bit better and got warmed up again, and I was in control. I felt good. Um, I was loving it, and it was good, okay? So if you think about that, where are you at currently in your in your life right now. If you, you are here, map, where are you at? 
So this is what he says. He says, you are in the flow when your skill set is high, when you're being challenged and your, your, your challenges are high and your skill set are being stretched. So you always have to be growing. You always have to be growing. Even right now, if you're 18, 19, 20, 25 years old, if you learn this now where you, have, you get that understanding where I know exactly what I want to do in my life. I'm not going to waste any more time and I'm going to go for it. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to stretch myself. You get in this zone that everything just lights up. You get so happy because happiness isn't just relaxing. Happiness just isn't, I know for my wife, she does love going to the pool and sitting at the beach and, and that's, but that's, but for some point of time, a lot of people, when they get to 65, they're like, we're just going to go retire and we're going to go relax. But what happens? Yeah, they get bored. They're not being challenged, right? So their happiness goes down. So that's why people don't retire anymore. They're out there. I'm going to go change the world when I retire. I don't ever want to retire. I want to be in the flow. I can't tell you how many CEOs that I know and that we deal with every day that are 65, 75 doing amazing things, and they are more pumped than they've ever been because they're in that zone. So I want you to get in that zone, get your, your skill power and your willpower aligned and be able to get right in that zone. This is what it looks like to be in the flow right there. You're just like, I can do this. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to take this thing to the mountain. So this is when you know, you're just like, you are after it and you're getting it done. So <clears throat> the last thing I want to really share with you that, that uh, I've always thought, and, and, a, and a friend of mine used to always say this, um, we work really closely with companies on both on innovation and ideation, but the main thing that we're really good at is helping them get really aligned with their three-year strategy, their annual operating priorities, and their um, quarterly priorities. Like every single week, what are they doing? What's happening? And we just see companies skyrocket. Our, one of our advisory members was the CEO, was a COO of Kraft Nabisco. Um, Virtus Norton was an amazing man. And he has a process called Stratlink. And that's what we teach. And he says, you know, if you don't set your own goals, someone else will use you for theirs. And I couldn't help but think about this tonight. Um, when Amy was talking. To, and Jason, when, we, when you don't know, set your goals, especially your spiritual goals, there will be somebody else that may use you for theirs. Sorry, I'm getting emotional. I, I had a friend that went to that, to that probability, that probability side a little bit too far, and, and we lost him the other day. And um, one of the most amazing men. Um, so I just want to challenge you to set goals. Honestly, use it. Find out where is, where is my flow? Where do, I, where do I excel the best? And all of us don't run around the track the same way. We're not going to all build billion-dollar companies or do that but you might be the most amazing teacher ever and change tons of kids' lives. You might be an artist. You might be the best, you know, you might be a, a guitar-playing accountant that just rocks it. You know, you might be able to do some of those things. So as you think about that, you know, um, think of your goals. I can't stress the importance of it and how quick you can actually move and how much you can do in a short period of time. And so we work on that every single day. Um, this is one of my favorite books. If you haven't read it, I would encourage you to, is How Will, your, how will You Measure Your Life? Um, I went, to, when I was back, uh, back east of Boston, Clayton M. Christensen taught, taught Sunday school for us, and it was the most amazing Sunday school ever, some of the things that he shared. He's an example to me of someone that shares the gospel nonstop, is a leader in the business community, and is not, is not afraid to share his testimony of a Savior, Jesus Christ, in any circumstance, ever. And uh, he says this, he says, because if the decisions you make about where you invest your blood, sweat, and tears are not consistent with the person you aspire to be, you will never become that person. And I love that word, you're not consistent with the person you aspire to be. Think about the word spire. I love words. The word spire is to look up. Where do you find spires at, right? On our temples, churches, all over. We're looking up to God. So aspire is what you want to become. How do you lift more? To perspire is to work, right? 
We all have to work, but work is fun if you love what you do. I love every second of every day of what I do right now. Then, you, then you're able to inspire. You can inspire people all over the world and hopefully bring them to Jesus Christ. And then you can conspire, which doesn't, isn't a bad thing, but we've made it that, but conspire means to work together. It's a word that means to work closely together and then to transpire means to become. And I hope that you all transpire amazingly. I hope that you all stay frothy all the time. I hope that you understand tonight what it means to believe, belong, and become. And I hope we all come become like our Heavenly Father and our Jesus, and, and Jesus Christ. I know that Jesus is our Savior. I know that he worries about us and he cares about us. And it's through him that we can, grow, can, can really wield our strength from him. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Randy Garn. Goodness.